Welcome to our community and to the work that we're doing. It's lovely to have you here. And uh, for those of you that have been on lots of our webinars, we thank you very much and um, thank you for your ongoing support. This is an incredible series of extraordinary global thinkers and scientists and clinicians, uh, leaders from around the world, and um, we're very proud to have them as ambassadors and advisors of Mind Medicine Australia. So today we want to acknowledge the the owners of the lands on which we all come from, their elders past and present. And we want to acknowledge the wisdom keepers, the light keepers, the medicine holders who've brought us to this place and passed on this ancient wisdom to us so that we can heal, especially in these times of enormous di division and disconnection where many people are suffering and feeling lonely and separate, separated and isolated and uncertain about the future. It is a time more, more important than ever that we come together as one collective, global, conscious humanity. So we want to say that and encourage all of you. Thank you for being here. You obviously all care deeply. Who of you are therapists? Hands up if you're a therapist. And we just acknowledge your incredible, great work in the world. Thank you for all you do for caring for others. Okay, so we're going to just show a few quick introductory slides to Mind Medicine Australia now, just so that you can understand a little of what we're doing, how you can be involved. And we see that there's people on the chat. Let's see where they're all from. Hang on a second. We have people from, let's see, New York, Sydney, Melbourne, Toronto, California, IA, New Zealand, Cairns, Seattle. Virginia, Mexico, all over the world. So everyone wants to hear Dr. Ron because he's such an extraordinary speaker and teacher. And Ron today will be talking about mindfulness, compassion, and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Next slide, please. And just a reminder to all of you that our focus is on the development of these therapies within the regulated healthcare environments and our presentations are for educational purposes and we encourage you to discuss whatever your health needs may be with your healthcare providers. The sessions are recorded and they will be shared on our YouTube channel and um, you can go back and watch all of the wonderful webinars. Next slide, thank you. So we have a massive mental health epidemic in Australia, one in four Australians have a mental illness currently. One in six Australians are on antidepressants, one in six. That figure has risen enormously over the last decade and is rising all the time. And sadly, you know, children as young as four being prescribed with psychiatric medications and one in four older people over the age of 55 are on antidepressants. This comes at a massive cost to the community and particularly leads to massive suffering. And unfortunately, the majority of these medicines are not getting the majority of patients well. Next slide. So the elephant in the room is the lack of innovation in treatments for mental illness for the best part of at least 50 years. And you can see the elephant there is trying to tell the bureaucrats, well, we need different treatments. We need better treatments. We need a range of tools in our toolbox so that we can actually get our patients well. Next slide. So in the case of depression, only about 15% of sufferers experience remission from existing pharma pharmacotherapy like antidepressants, SSRIs, and or psychotherapy. Huge relapse rates from these medicines and significant side effects. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, as few as five to 10% of patients may respond to oh, as may have remission from uh, the treatments available for post-traumatic stress disorder. That's compared against remission rates of approximately 60 to 80% after just two to three medicinal doses of psilocybin for depression or MDMA for PTSD accompanied by psychotherapy. So many, many more people could be getting better with psychedelic-assisted therapies as an option for treatment for the right patients. 
definitely more of the same approach is not going to solve the problem. Next slide. So Mind Medicine Australia is a charity founded by myself my, and my husband, Peter Hunt. We have a wonderful team, an extraordinary advisory panel and ambassadors, a lived experience panel and groups all over the world who support this work and want to see these medicines used in clinical environments to heal the immense suffering in our communities. Our focus is making sure that these medicines are used in a controlled way, that they become an integral part of our mental health system, a first line treatment option, that they continue to achieve the high remission rates that they're achieving, which I just mentioned of 60 to 80% across hundreds of trials, and that they're accessible and affordable to all people who need them. So we do that through our patient support fund, and of course, through talking to insurers and others who can help to make the costs more affordable to all people so that these are not just medicines for people in capital cities or those who are wealthier. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier, these medicines only require up two to three dosing sessions in combination with a short course of psychotherapy to achieve cures. So they are curative medicines, they're not palliative medicines, just managing a condition. No one who gets a mental illness should feel like their mental illness is a life sentence and they should always feel that there's hope and that they can get better through the different therapies that are available, including psychedelic-assisted therapies. Both of these medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation, a rare designation provided by the FDA two medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track their approval process. And both medicines show extremely high safety results with no serious adverse events and no evidence of addiction. We're also interested in ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And of course, there's also trials taking place at the moment for a whole range of other medicines, including LSD, ayahuasca, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT, and so on. Next slide, thank you. So how does it all work? Well, Ron, are you going to talk a little bit about the the mechanism of how these medicines work? Um, I'm going to talk about not the neurobiological mechanisms, but I'm going to talk about the psychological mechanisms. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about these lovely, lovely um, circles that we're looking at right now. So particularly with psilocybin, we see this alteration of communi communication between different brain networks. And we see a bypassing of what's called the default mode network, which keeps us defaulting and stuck in very rigid patterns of thinking. I'm not good enough, things won't work out and so on. And we can see these representations of fMRI scans on the right of this slide with a person who's got a very limited thinking, which is, you know, most of us as we get older, we, we tend to become more stuck and more rigid. And then we have a dose of psilocybin and look at what happens, this massive neurogenesis, this increased neuroplasticity, different parts of the brain starting to talk to one another. And it's really interesting to note that both of these circles have the same amount of dots and lines. It's just that one brain is functioning far more freely and, and having many more associations between neural networks than the other one. And it's in that state of connection, of real connectivity, as you can see, with the psilocybin, that a skilled therapist can work with the patient to really increase their healing and to accelerate their healing process. The insights that patients achieve when they're in that altered state are significant, and many patients describe these medicinal treatments as one of the top five most meaningful experiences in their lives. This is really important because whoever says that about a medicine normally, let alone, you know, we don't even want to take our medicine, let alone having these extraordinary experiences with these medicines that provide these insights, this window of opportunity for skilled clinicians like Ron to come in and then help you to heal. So there, also the other really important thing I want to say about this is that these are short treatment programs and that patients become much more empowered to heal themselves. So instead of taking daily tablets, they're going, well, how can I get off these tablets and how can I start leading my the life that is everyone's birthright, a life of contribution of happiness and health? Next slide, thank you. 
So Mind Medicine Australia's focus has always been to build the ecosystem for these medicines to become available. And we do that through four strategic pillars, awareness and knowledge building. So webinars like these, we educate clinicians and politicians and the general public and a whole range of other different stakeholders. We hold other summits and other events. We also have a really leading professional development program, our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. And I, Ron, are you on the faculty of that? I'm trying to recall. I think you are. Uh, um, yeah, I, I have been. I have been contributing to that. Yes. Yeah, we have an extraordinary world class faculty, which includes people like Ron, and you'll see in a moment because I'll show you. But our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies um, teaches clinicians how to work with these therapies, and we provide this course for psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors nurses, occupational therapists, social workers, counsellors, psychotherapists, and a whole range of others to equip them with the skills. And the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia, has recognised our course as um, a course that is recognised to provide psychiatrists with authorised prescriber status so they can actually prescribe the medicines and treat their patients with these treatments in Australia currently. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, in addition, we also support uh, a whole range of research and help secure $15 million of funding through our government, which was the largest federal grant still ever um, granted by government for R&D in this space. And we're very focused on providing regulatory access to these medicines through uh, clinical rollouts and through the work we've done with the TGA, which I hope is the next slide with um, the TGA slide. Is that the next one? Hopefully, I'll show you that in a moment, everyone. Where is that slide, Alan? And there it is. So um, one thing our team is very proud of is the fact that we did achieve the world first rescheduling of psilocybin MDMA in 2023. This is highly significant because it was the first nation in the world to reschedule psilocybin and MDMA from prohibited substance to a controlled medicine. And you can see just some of the global headlines about that. And that has led to these medicines now being able to be prescribed by authorised prescribing psychiatrists in Australia. And there are a number of psychiatrists in Australia who are currently prescribing and treating their patients with psilocybin and MDMA-assisted therapies. And we're hearing some extraordinary outcomes from that. Next slide, thank you. To a whole range of upcoming events. Ilan, where's that wonderful achievement slide? I do need to show that. So could you bring that up, please? And also the CPAT slide. So upcoming events, you can see some extraordinary events in our global webinar series. And um, they're coming up now. And um, I'm just going to hopefully be able to show you a few more slides about our CPAT course and a few other things. Next slide, thank you. So this is our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. Ilana, I will need that, that other slide, you know, the one after the four pillar strategy. Thank you. Um, so this is our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. It's a four month program, takes place with a whole range of online sessions with some of the world's leaders in this field. We'll show you the teacher's slide in a moment. And um, is available to all of these classes of practitioners. So that includes a whole range of complementary medicine practitioners as well. There's also a six-day intensive which with each of the um, CPAT intakes and many of the students describe this training as the most exciting and inspiring and educational professional development training they've done in their careers. David Nutt described our course as the world leading CPAP course. Next slide, thank you. And here is some of the teachers. We have people like Gabor Mate, Geeta Vaid, our wonderful international course leader, Lauren McDonald from Imperial College, David Nutt, Rick Doblin, Bill Richards, Arthur Christopoulos, um, Bessel van der Kolk, many others. It's an extraordinary faculty who you will be learning from. Our next intake closes on May the 31st for our July intake. So 
I would encourage you all, for those of you who are interested, to apply as soon as possible. Scott, who is on this call, is our executive officer and he manages our CPAC course. And you can also put questions into the chat if you have anything that you would like to ask Scott about this course. Next slide, thank you. Lots of ways to help us apply for the training, attend our events, talk to your doctors so that they get really curious and interested in psychedelic assisted therapies. Follow us on social media. Please donate to our patient support fund. We really need your support because there are many, many people who can't afford these treatments, the upfront costs, though the upfront costs will be way less than what a person may spend across their whole life in terms of getting themselves well or continuing suffering. However, we all need to do what we can to help those who cannot afford these treatments. And we encourage you to support in large, small donations, whatever you can. I'll ask Scott to put a link to the donate page on our website now and encourage you all to support us in whatever you, way you can. We're philanthropists, but we cannot do this alone. Thank you. Next slide. And this is what donations support, financial assistance towards practitioner development, our patient support fund, um, and a whole range of other things. Next slide. We also have some great, wonderful mushroom cards. We have Australia's first book of psychedelic healing stories and our great Mind Medicine Australia t-shirts and more. Next slide, thank you. So, Alain, if you could bring up that achievement slide, thank you. Thanks so much. And then I can introduce Ron. And Alain, if you can include that, please, from now on. I'm having a little trouble seeing that. Can you make that full screen? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Bear with us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is just um, some of the achievements. This is for those of you who are new to our community, and many of you are today. You can see that our big focus has been on patient access. So that's through the rescheduling that I mentioned and the patient support fund, the awareness that I just spoke about through our events, the professional development and the research. And in any ways that you want to get involved with us with anything, please reach out to us. I'll ask um, Scott to put a, a general link to a uh, general email so you can put in any inquiries that you like by email as well. And look, this is also about word of mouth. You know, we run these webinars every month or so, and we encourage you to tell at least two or three friends about this work so that each time we have more and more people coming along. I mean, there's well over, I think, 400 people registered for this webinar, Dr. Ron. So a lot of them are obviously going to be watching on the video because of time, time zones and work commitments and so on. Anyway, now I have the great pleasure of introducing our extraordinary speaker, Dr. Ron Siegel. He works at the, at the Harvard Medical School as assistant professor in psychology part-time and serves on the board of directors and faculty of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. He's the author of many, many books, including The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, which I've read, wonderful, Finding Happiness Right Where You Are, the Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday Problems and Sitting Together, Essential Skills for Mindfulness-Based Psychotherapy. He's also a regular contributor to other professional publications, is co-director of the annual Harvard Medical School Conferences on Meditation and Psychotherapy. Hey, Ron, I'd love to come and come to one of those if you, uh, I can add some special musical and other magic, um, mindful magic. And of course, he knows an awful lot about psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. So we're very delighted. Ron is one of the members of Mind Medicine Australia's advisory panel and on our CPAP faculty. Please let's give him a big round of applause. Yay, Ron. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction and for um, sharing with everybody uh, something of what Mind Medicine Australia is doing. You're, you know, you're clearly on the vanguard uh, worldwide 
um, in, uh, uh, in in getting these these medicines in the context of psychotherapy um, to be accessible to as as many people as possible. And uh, we're working in in similar ways in the United uh, United States, hoping for a similar rollout. Uh, perhaps as soon as after August this year, we will uh, we will see what the Food and Drug Administration does. Um, so what I'd like awesome. to talk. <laughs> Um, what, what I'd like to share with you are some reflections on the role of mindfulness and compassion practices in psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. And this is this is really fitting what I think is a um a new stage that we're reaching in uh in this exploration, which is on the one hand, there have been research studies, and it is these research studies that have led to government um rescheduling in the case of Australia or approval for um uh um, compassionate use and hopefully approval for more general use of these medicines in the context of of psychotherapy but the psychotherapy has not been defined very much in um in these endeavors and uh what i what i'm going to suggest is that what we know to be useful in psychotherapies more broadly, may be able to support what we're doing in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And I've been particularly involved in the world of integrating mindfulness practices and compassion practices into psychotherapy. And, and I think there is a very natural synergy, a very good fit um, uh, between these practices and uh, psychedelic assisted work. So I, I th think what I'll do is share with you some um, uh, some basic ideas for a while, and then we'll have some time to discuss together with um, with questions and answers. Um, so can you see a title slide here? Yes, we can. You can, excellent. And let me make sure that when I go to presenter view, are you still seeing the title slide? We are, yes. Excellent, okay. Um, I want to start with actually my own uh, history about this because uh, my personal experiences have very much shaped my understanding of the synergies between uh, mindfulness and compassion practices and uh, psychotherapy. Now, this is a little book that was published in the in the uh, 1960s by actually uh, two Harvard professors and. Uh, and their colleague um, by the name of Tim Leary and Richard Alpert, who later became uh, Ram Dass. And I was a kid growing up in New York City, and uh, I came across this book and read it. And what it, what it purported to do was present an outline for what a psychedelic journey in a spiritual context might look like. And it was loosely based on their understanding of the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And what they suggested was that if one goes into a psychedelic experience with an intention of developing psychologically and spiritually, um, you might pass through a few different phases. There might be an, an early phase in which a great deal of what we might call the Freudian or personal unconscious comes into awareness. In other words, uh, conflicts, longings, uh, past uh, traumatic injuries and the like. And if one can hold an accepting and um, curious attitude toward those experiences, they might pass into a second phase, which we might think of as a more Jungian psychological phase in which that's more mythopoetic kinds of images will come up, the kind of images that we see in poetry and in mythology and uh, that cut across the world's cultures of representations of archetypes, of universals in human uh, psychology and un universal in human psychological suffering. And if one were to stay open to that and continue on this journey, one might enter into what gets called a clear light, what gets called a non-dual state, what gets called a transpersonal state, a, a state in which all of the activity, whether the personal unconscious material or the hallucinatory mythopoetic activity, quiets down and there's simply normal reality as there was prior to taking the medicine, but without a sense of I, with a sense of interconnectedness to 
all things and a sense that the boundaries, the conceptual boundaries that we draw between this and that are actually rather arbitrary, um, uh, psychological and culturally determined lines. And with this comes a profound sense of peace and an oetic quality, a sense that this is a deeply meaningful experience. Well, there I was, a 17-year-old kid growing up in, uh, it's actually just outside of New York City. And uh, it was a countercultural zeitgeist at the time. And uh, I experimented with some LSD, having read the book, and it happened. I wound up going through those phases and encountered this powerful non-dual state of clarity as an adolescent and as a atheist by the way and somebody who probably had it not been for this experience would have been a mechanical engineer i was always taking apart machines and figuring out how they worked and i was uh, kind of a rational positivist in my view of the world well this shifted everything and i became interested in who knows about these states who knows about this kind of transformation? And I was led to the world's religious traditions and particularly traditions that were deeply involved in yogic and meditative practices. I actually concentrated in this at, at university. I was a religion major, despite being quite non-theistic in my uh, orientation. And then later when I became a psychologist, I was already quite steeped in Buddhist psychology. I was really quite steeped in these meditative practices and they really informed my understanding of Western psychology. Fast forward a number of years and I'm uh, in the Harvard medical school system, first training and then teaching. And I find other people who had been very much involved in these meditative practices. And we started meeting as a study group but we stayed very much under the radar because Boston in that era, I'm talking about the, the, um, the later 1970s, the very early 1980s, Boston was very heavily psychoanalytic and nobody wanted to discuss meditation practice because nobody wanted to be accused of having unresolved infantile longings to return to a state of oceanic oneness, which is how Freud understood uh, meditation practices. Uh, so we stayed quiet and we just talked among ourselves about how these practices might be able to be integrated in or enhance psychotherapy. And in fact, how what we know from cognitive science and what we know from clinical science might inform the wisdom traditions out of which come these meditative practices. Some years went on, psychoanalysis fell somewhat out of favor, empirically supported treatments became all the rage. And then we didn't want to discuss it because nobody wanted to be accused of being a mystic in the age of science. Well, then dialectical behavior therapy came along, mindfulness based cognitive therapy came along. We started to have empirically validated treatments based on mindfulness. So we started we started coming out of the shadows and we actually started writing and teaching. And there's a whole cadre of us in and around the Harvard Medical School system who really wrote a number of um, seminal books that were involved uh, to try to introduce this into the mental health field. Uh, fast forward some more, and we can now start to talk about psychedelics, right? Because there, there's the um, uh, the empirically supported research that's going on, and we see the, the, uh, the rollout um, of uh, changes in regulation, and we see such robust responses in, uh, in many of the research studies. So what I want to do is tie these things together now and talk about the synergies between these meditative practices that we know are useful in psychotherapy and psychedelics that are useful in, psych in, in psychotherapy because they're both doing something remarkably similar, although they're doing it at, other, at, at different paces. One other piece of history here. So I was talking to a, a good friend of mine who was somewhat my senior um, in, in terms of her age and cohort, who basically knows everybody who is a well-known name in the, the field of people who brought meditation practices to the West. The, uh, there's, a, there's a whole cadre of, of people who are currently pushing 80 that were 80 years of age. They were quite involved in this. And we were sitting and talking and I said, so how many of them had a psychedelic experience as an inflection point in their life that got them interested in meditation practice and spurred their, them going to India or, or in other ways studying? And she thought for a while and she thought, well, almost all of them. So historically, 
there is a huge synergy between people having psychedelic experiences and people taking up meditation practices. And that's, that, that is clearly um, uh, what happened to me. So mindfulness practices stamp, go back from about 2500 BCE. They were an innovation on the part of the Buddha. Mindfulness and psychotherapy much more a product of the 90s and the 2000s. And of course, psychedelics go back to something like 8,000 BCE. And here's a question. Why is it that throughout so many periods in history, people have gravitated toward non-ordinary states of mind for healing? What is it? about the nature of human beings that makes us need these for healing. Because I think if we're going to understand the synergies between mindfulness practices and compassion practices and psychedelic assisted work, we need to, if they're doing something similar, it would be helpful to step back and address, well, what's the problem that they're trying to solve? And I'd suggest that the principal problem that they're trying to solve is that we didn't evolve to be happy. Rather, our brains evolved for essentially two purposes, to survive and to survive long enough to be able to reproduce and then protect our offspring. Anything else was kind of gravy in terms of the brain's evolution. And it is because of these propensities to, uh, be because of the ways in which we evolved um, uh, basically uh, for survival that we have um, that we run into so many different kinds of disorders and that psychedelics as well as mindfulness practices can help us to resolve these disorders. So in what ways did we evolve um, here that, uh, that are pro problematic? Well, the first is a response which is extremely basic in human beings. And this is our aversion response. What does an aversion response mean? It means that when we encounter something which is painful, we recoil from it. And this is shared by all animals, even bacterium. A bacterium, if it encounters a toxin, it'll pull back. If it encounters a nutrient, it'll go, it'll go forward. And clearly our ancestors learning that, hey, you know, pull your hand out of the fire, avoid sharp rocks and the like was gonna be very helpful for our survival and living long enough to reproduce. And while this basic instinct is super helpful for survival and reproduction, it turns out to be a disaster in the psychological realm. And I'll just quickly give you a few examples of this. Um, if you would, and uh, I, I, can, I can see you a little bit in the view, raise your hand if you ever drink alcohol. Most of us drink alcohol from time to time. Now raise your hand if you do it entirely for the taste. Not nearly as many hands are going up for entirely for the taste. Um, why do we drink alcohol? Let's go back to imagine our, um, uh, but, well, let's just think of, of a current day. Let's, let's assume that you're, uh, you're a clinician, many of you are therapists, and you've had a hard day, you've seen a lot of patients, you've heard of a, a, a lot of trauma, and musculoskeletally, you look something like this, and you think, well, you know, a glass of wine wouldn't be so bad right now. Or we're going to go to a party, and there are going to be people there we don't know, or worse, people there who we do know, and we think, you know, I think a glass of wine wouldn't be a bad way to start this. When we drink alcohol, we're trying to change one state a not so pleasant state into another state, which is more pleasant. It's this very basic aversion response. Do it in moderation, no problem. Do it habitually, need it in order to get through the day. Clearly substance use disorder kind of problem. Let's look at other things. Let's look at anxiety. If I get anxious before public speaking, or I get anxious before flying in airplanes, but I do these things anyway, I don't have an anxiety disorder, I'm just a nervous guy. If however, I start to avoid public speaking, and avoid flying in airplanes in order not to feel the anxiety, well, then I'm on my way to, um, to an anxiety disorder. Even if we look at something like depression, think for a moment of the difference between sadness and depression. We've all been sad and we've all been depressed. And just take a moment to reflect on how it feels to be sad and how it feels to be depressed. And how are they different? 
And most people will say, well, depression feels like it's going to last forever. That's true. It almost always has this narrative that it's going to last forever. And depression feels kind of dead. It feels kind of cut off. It feels kind of disconnected. We can be sad. We can be at a funeral. And I was just at a memorial for my wife's high school friend who, who passed away. And, you know, people would were very sad, but they remembered funny things that she had done. They remembered poignant moments and they were filled with joy, with smiling, with their hearts being lifted and connected. When Shakespeare wrote 400 years ago, parting is such sweet sorrow, we know what he meant. Had he written parting is such sweet depression, we'd think this guy can't write and we wouldn't be reading him anymore. So depression involves, as one of its components, a kind of shutting down on experience, a kind of pushing away, often from painful experience, whether it be anger or sadness, that leaves us in a somewhat deadened state. Also, it's an aversion disorder. Take PTSD. What's the, the heart of PTSD is about blocking painful mental contents out of awareness, right? Trying not to remember the thing that hurt, that happened, trying not to remember the shameful incident. And it's actually the mind's natural healing intelligence, its propensity to want to integrate itself that brings these previously blocked out contents flooding into awareness, and then we have PTSD symptoms. So PTSD is also about aversion. So the take home point here is that this is the a very, very fundamental aspect of the human brain to try to avoid pain and seek pleasure. But in the psychological realm, it's actually at the heart of our central disorders. And one of the things we're gonna see shortly is that both psychedelics and mindfulness and compassion practices are about relaxing the aversion response and moving toward that which is difficult. And interestingly, if we practice that in mindfulness practice, we're actually gonna be better at doing it in the psychedelic experience and if we've had the experience of doing it in, in, with psychedelics, we're going to find an easier time to practice mindfulness and to, rather than give into aversion, to move toward that which is, um, uh, which is painful. And in a little while, we'll talk about how this can work for the preparation phase, how this can work during the medicine session itself, and how this can work for the integration phase to have a response other than aversion. Let's look at some other propensities of the brain. So this is an artist's conception of Lucy. She's our great, 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 great grandmother. And she lived on the African savanna about 3.2 million years ago. And uh, most paleontologists believe that she's our common ancestor. So we know she survived, but how? She was only about a meter tall. And what were her resources? Well. She had, uh, she's a social animal, so she could cooperate with peers to hunt or warn of danger. What else did she have? Well, um, you know, she had, you know, a reasonable sense of hearing and sight and the like, but not particularly well advanced. She wasn't very fast. One of the first things they tell you if you ever go on a so-called walking safari in Africa is no matter what happens, don't run. Why? Because everything out there that's scary is faster than you are. So what'd she have going for her? Well, she was she had a prehensile thumb so she could eventually make tools. That was gonna be very helpful when she evolved into homo habilis. But, and she had a fight or flight response for emergencies. But the main thing she had was this capacity to think, right? She could imagine the past and the future and strategize for survival. And clearly this is what put us way ahead of other animals in so many ways. It's why we now have PowerPoint and why I can talk to you from outside of Boston and you're all over the world. But this capacity to think isn't just some neutral computer. It has this extremely strong negativity bias. As my friend Rick Hansen puts it, the brain evolved to be like Teflon for good experiences and Velcro for bad ones. The good ones slide right off the pan, the bad ones stick. And we can see why this evolved, because if, if, if you could imagine her on the African savanna and looking at an ambiguous shape, let's say a bay shape behind some bushes, she could make one of two types of errors that correspond to type one and type two errors in modern scientific research. A type one error would be to go, oh my God, it's a lion. 
when it was really just a beige rock. A type two error would be, ah, it's probably a beige rock when it's really a lion. Now she could have made countless type one errors and still passed on her DNA. One type two error, that's the end of the DNA, her DNA line. So we might imagine that there were happy hominids in her day, holding hands, sharing stories of luscious pieces of fruit and dynamite sexual encounters, but they weren't our ancestors because statistically they died before they got to reproduce. Our ancestors were running around the savannah going, oh my God, it's a lion. Oh no, not a poisonous snake. Oh, there's one of those wait a while bushes. Get the Australian reference. The the um, They remembered all the bad stuff. And this obviously wreaks havoc on us because we're constantly anxious. We're constantly anticipating bad things remembering bad things, and it leads to a lot of anxiety and depression. So the second thing we're going to see is that the non-ordinary states that we get from mindfulness practices and psychedelics help to loosen up this attachment to thinking. They help us to develop what's called metacognitive awareness, the ability to actually see a thought as a thought rather than as a reality. The way we do that in mindfulness practice is we repeatedly come back to a sensory object, right? We're gonna come back to the breath. We're gonna come back to sounds. We're gonna come back to the feet on the ground. And we're gonna watch clouds coming and going like clouds in the sky, or as the Zen masters say, let the clouds come in, let, let the thoughts come in the front door and leave by the rear door, but don't invite them for tea. Don't get caught in the narrative, but allow for this kind of fluidity. And anybody who, who's had uh, journeys with psychedelics knows that linear thought doesn't have a chance, right? There's a constant fluid flow of experience that happens in which thoughts come, thoughts go, but we experience them as profoundly unreliable. So both of these help us to develop metacognitive awareness. And what we'll see is that mindfulness practices by training us to step out of the thought stream, step out of the thought stream, step out of the thought stream, can help us in preparation to really be open to whatever's going to happen in the medicine session and then in integration to start to hold more lightly and to have a kind of relative view of our core narratives and particularly of the painful core narratives such as the depressive core narratives or the anxious core narratives and the like. You think that's bad? Well, it gets worse. We also suffer from something called reification. And this is the tendency of the brain to see things that are fluid as though they are solid. And this makes perfect sense evolutionarily why this would be highly adaptive because you wanna remember that by the bend in the river, that's where the fruit tree grows that gives you the fruit, which is wonderful when it's fresh and when it's rotten, it turns fermented and then you can get into the substance use disorder. The, but you remembering those things is gonna be highly adaptive for our survival and our reproductive. Again, in the psychological realm, it's a recipe for disaster because when we're anxious or we're depressed, we have the fantasy it's gonna last forever. In fact, that's a cardinal feature of depression is the thought that I'm never gonna get any better. I'm never gonna find the love I need. I'm never gonna find the job I need. I'm never gonna feel safe. I'm never gonna is you know, virtually always part of the depressive narrative. And with the anxious narratives, it's the idea of I have to do something to make my anxiety go away because I can't trust in the fluidity of consciousness. Well, here again, both mindfulness practices and the psychedelic experiences help us to see, oh my gosh, it's consciousness is a fluid river. Yes, the contents are, the, the river is constantly here. There's constantly awareness, but the contents are ever changing, ever changing, ever changing. And the more we can trust that mental states are ever changing, the less we get caught in them. And one of the reasons why we use music so often in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is to keep this sense of movement going, to help people realize I can actually take refuge in the fact that consciousness is fluid. And here again, when people practice mindfulness and compassion practices, we learn about this fluidity of consciousness and we come to expect it and it makes it easier to let go. And finally, I'm only gonna say a few words about this is the problem with selfing. Cause out there on the African Savannah, there was a classic scenario in which there would be a dominant male surrounded by a reproductively promising harem, literal harem of females 
And then over in the next field, and now I'm talking about social mammals generally, not just hominids. Over in the next field, there'd be a group of younger males doing the species specific equivalent of playing football or basketball, trying to get the skills to be dominant. Now, what's all this concern with dominance? Well, the dominant males had a better shot at finding reproductively promising females to consort with and a better shot at getting resources to their partners and to their kids. And that meant that those hominids who were interested in dominance actually had a reproductive advantage if they were interested in it and successful at it. And even though we're no longer you know, beating each other uh, with sticks necessarily, although it happens plenty of times in the world, and we're no longer doing, you know, these kinds of displays or genital displays so much, the way this shows up in humans is with constant preoccupation with issues of self-esteem, of feeling I'm either good enough or not good enough, somebody's better than me, I haven't achieved enough, I'm not popular enough, I'm not generous enough, I'm not good enough, all, all of these constant, constant negative judgments. And here we also see the, the, the potential for mindfulness, compassion practices, and psychedelics together. Together, they can help shift us out of this preoccupation with believing ourselves to be separate selves and start to see the interconnectedness that we have with everything else. This was the aim of many, many meditative practices and spiritual traditions, and it's what we see happening so often with psychedelics. So that's a quick romp through what's what's wrong and what gets us into trouble. What I'd like to do is share with you a few thoughts about mindfulness and compassion, and then we'll zero in on some of these synergies. So therapeutic mindfulness is often defined as awareness of present experience with loving acceptance. And it used to be in the early days of mindfulness and psychotherapy, and, fra and frankly, in the early days of bringing Buddhist practice into, um, uh, into psychotherapy, that the emphasis was on awareness, really noticing moment by moment what's going on. Well, there's been an evolution because it turns out that clinically, what's much more important is the loving acceptance part. So take a moment and join me in looking at this fellow. And I want you to notice what you feel inside when you look at him. And raise your hand if your dominant reaction is harsh critical judgment. If so, send me an email, we'll talk later. Because most of us, when we look at him, we have kind of the universal experience of compassion. Something like, oh. Now, even if he were to pee and poop at the wrong time, even if he weren't to listen to instructions, we think he's young, he needs training, he needs love. One of the things we learned with mindfulness practice is that the mind does pee and poop at the wrong time. And it absolutely does not listen to instructions. And increasingly, we figure out how to develop loving acceptance toward this. And in so doing, we develop this, at, this friendly attitude toward the whole range of contents in the mind. And this too is gonna to be such an important synergy for, um, for the uh, mindfulness and, and psychotherapy work. So let me let me move directly now to to talk explicitly about how these synergies unfold, and then um, then we can open it up to uh, to some discussion. So first, mindfulness practice is super useful for preparation for psychedelic assisted work. If we can develop the attitude in our mindfulness practice of welcoming whatever arises in awareness, then when we get into the journey itself, we're going to already be in that habit. And those of you who have worked in the psychedelic space know that so-called bad experience or bad trip is basically the experience of resisting what's happening. Something painful arises, and what we do is we go, oh no, I don't want to experience that, the aversion response I was talking to about earlier. And because these medicines are mind manifesting, particularly with the psychedelics that have a hallucinatory property, if I have a feeling of, oh no, I don't want to see that, and I'm in this contracted aversion response, what's going to show up in my visual field is going to be monstrous. It's going to be something which is a manifestation of this constricted, sympathetically aroused aversion state, right? And so then I'm going to have a monster in front of me or a bloody scene or 
rejection or something aversive is going to happen and that's going to generate even more aversion and i'm off to the races and you know when people have bad trips it's almost always getting stuck in this biologically important propensity for aversion and then it amplifies and it becomes a recursive loop if we practice mindfulness we're going to be able, we're going to be in the habit of moving toward this which is aversive and we're much less likely to get caught in that and we're much more likely for the journey to be able to unfold in a um uh uh, in a way where we also don't get stuck in reification because we get to realize consciousness is fluid and we can take refuge in that. Mindfulness is also super useful for enhancing therapist's presence. You've probably heard the expression holding space as a chief role of the therapist in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. What does that mean? That means being present in a loving and accepting way and being able to tolerate a wide range of emotions on the part of the client or patient. Because people encounter past trauma, they encounter wounds, they encounter fear, they encounter rage, and these affects manifest in the session. What we need to be able to do as a therapist is hang in there with an open heart and not constrict and defend ourselves so that we can actually stay present and stay connected. Well, mindfulness practices and compassion practices by teaching us how to be warmly connected to experience actually allow us to do this. So I would suggest this is very basic training for being able to be in the role of, of the therapist. And then finally, in the integration phase, what do we need to do in integration? Well, all this material came up in the session. There's often a radical reconsideration of sense of self and a real kind of shift of how we see ourselves. This is hard. When we snap back into normal ego preoccupied consciousness, it is, it's difficult <clears throat> to work with this material. Well, here too, if we've been practicing mindfulness, we're in the habit of being with that which is difficult rather than recoiling it. We're in the habit of not getting so caught in core beliefs, but being able to allow thoughts to come and go, and we're gonna be in the habit of being less concerned with me as being separate from everybody. When I think of my friend, Bill Richards, who teaches in the uh, program, he says, look, back, it, so Bill was the last psychologist in America to legally give psilocybin before the war on drugs shut it down. He says, okay, three principles are what we're teaching our clients or, or patients, to trust, let go, and open to the experience to be aware of present experience with loving acceptance. It's the same principles. He's really talking about teaching mindfulness practice um, to folks. And if we do it with what we know about teaching mindfulness practice from now, quite a few years of integrating this into psychotherapy, we're gonna have a leg up on this. And even in the session itself, we can start to use the breath as a surfboard. I've had many, many psychedelic experiences where I've been, I've been involved with a group that's, that's really involved in uh, exploring psychedelic assisted meditation practice in which you're beginning with meditation practice, you're introducing a medicine and you're seeing at what dosage of the medicine can you continue with the meditation practice. And what one learns is at least that at lower or moderate doses, one can stay with the breath and the breath provides a kind of anchor that allows for radical acceptance of all of the different um, events that arise uh, in, the, um, uh, in the psychedelic uh, journey. So I, I want to open it to questions, and I know we don't have that much time. Let me see what else I want to be sure to, um, to mention to you. Okay, I'll mention something very concrete. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this and learning somewhat more about these four propensities of the brain that create suffering and that we are using these non-ordinary states to resolve, right now on your phone or your computer, send a blank email to handouts at yahoo.com and put in the subject line, Australia. And I will share with you an article that's going to come out in the Psychotherapy Networker shortly that I've just finished that's really about these and about using these states in psychotherapy more broadly and how they how they show up in mindfulness practices as well as in um, uh, in psychedelic assisted work. Again, blank email on your phone or computer 
to handouts at yahoo.com and just put Australia in the subject line and I'll know it's you and I'll send something out. I'll, I'll usually wait about a week to send it out so that um, um, people have it, uh, uh, a chance to do that. Uh, what else to tell you about? Um, quick plug, if you're interested in particularly the way in which mindfulness practices can help with transpersonal awareness that we can dig into this a little bit in the uh, the questions and answers. Um, the, the book, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, Finding Happiness where, Right Where You Are, was kind of my attempt to tackle the challenges of self-esteem fluctuation, challenges of the fact that most everybody seems to fluctuate between either feeling inadequate in some way and down in the dumps or kind of stressed out trying to stay on top of our game. And both mindfulness practices and the psychedelic work, probably their most powerful effect is helping us to accept ourselves as we are and drop the whole social comparison um, burden that we suffer from. So this book is kind of a guide to... Um, uh, to doing that. And then I will just one more time um, put up the handouts at yahoo.com. And let me stop for a few minutes and hear, hear your thoughts about uh, any of this and uh, any of the different ways in which there, there are synergies between uh, meditative practices and the psychedelic work. And if you would, if, if you're not involved in some kind of illegal activity, please put on your cameras so that uh, we can come together as a community for uh, for the discussion. If your camera's off, I'll simply uh, tell the authorities to go check out what you're doing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ron. So uh, anybody have thoughts about this? What resonates, what doesn't resonate, or, or thoughts about this whole area of... Um, uh, psychedelic assisted meditation practice. I just came off of, a, I was just telling Ian and Scott that I, I just came from um, uh, something we're calling Dharma K, which is the our, our second iteration of a ketamine assisted uh, meditation practice in a retreat setting. And uh, fascinating to see uh, see the synergies there. I'm also happy to talk about that. But Megan, let's start let's start with your thoughts. Just unmute yourself. Perfect. Um, I was stepping back. I have so many thoughts that I'd love to share, but I wanted to allow everybody else to have a chance. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. You're talking exactly to what makes me most excited about psychedelic assisted therapy. I'm a long-term meditator and hearing you just so articulately talk about the stages of preparation and how each phase the meditative consciousness can articulate into providing the client with a robust container to navigate the experience makes my little heart sing so this is more of just a fangirl moment because there was silence from the participants and I thought no no this person does not need silence um, and I've given the name of the book and I've sent off the email for the handouts I very much want to read more because this is the work that I'm wanting to do within the psychedelic space I think this is like this is the pointy end of where we'll get the most out of this particular wonderful therapy yeah, and we have and we have the research studies showing that at least with several of the studies, particularly things like psilocybin with end of life care, it's the degree to which people have some kind of transpersonal experience where they basically have an experience that mindfulness practices are also designed to create. That's what seems to correlate to clinical improvement. So, um, Yes, <laughs> this is this is this is an exciting to to my mind too. This is an exciting aspect of um, uh, of this field. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Sam. Oh, you you're muted, Sam. Oops. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, yes. Thank you. Very exciting stuff. Um, this is a question that is uh, about. Um, psilocybin generally, um, but also to do with mindfulness in the sense that I know lots of people who have experimented with uh, psychedelic drugs um, uh, for recreational purposes, and they don't necessarily overcome uh, mental health conditions through those experiences, though lots of people do report that it can actually assist them. Um, I'm just wondering about whether mindfulness can help us to understand 
um, the difference between going to a rave or um, going through a medical process. Well, well, it, well, it's interesting. In in the realm of um, mindfulness and compassion practices, uh, we don't discuss them being used recreationally, right? <laughs> that um, that sure. when, we, <laughs> when, when, when we sit down to meditate or we take up a compassion practice, it's for um, it's for our own psycho spiritual growth and development, and or for that of our community. Um, whereas with psychedelics, they can be used with the deliberate intention of psychological and spiritual growth, or they can be used, you know, like going to a movie, right? I, you know, I, I want to have different sensory experiences and the like. And um, the people sometimes will bump up against psychological and spiritual growth when they're using the medicines recreationally but they can also bump up against a lot of other things like unresolved trauma without a container to hold it. Um, so, uh, you know, while I'm not a fan of putting people in jail for, for recreational use, and I'm not going to judge people for watching TV or recreational use of a psychedelic, um, uh, I'm mostly interested in how, uh, how all of these endeavors, whether they be mindfulness and compassion practices or psychedelics, can be used to increase our wisdom and compassion, to really inch us in the direction of sanity. Um, and intentionally. Intentionally. Um, yeah. And along the way, that involves resolving psychopathology. I mean, I, I told you my little story of evolution of coming from psychedelics to meditation to being a psychologist. When I'm thinking in terms of resolving psychopathology, I'm thinking in terms of helping people to awaken more in one way or another. You know, the to my mind, there isn't a particular difference between resolving PTSD symptoms by helping a person to reintegrate a painful experience that they've blocked out of awareness and becoming whole, becoming authentic, learning how to be present. Just as an example, you know, Wilhelm Reich one of um, Freud's uh, followers and uh, who developed body-oriented therapies and things like bioenergetics, somatic experiencing, most of the body-oriented Pat Ogden's work, the body-oriented therapies that are, are, are known today, um, they really derive from Reich's work. And Reich had famously said um, in his early years that if, I can't imitate his accent, but if a person could fully experience an orgasm, it would mean that they were free from psychoneuroses. And I think he was right, but a little too narrow. If a person can fully experience a cup of tea, it means they're free <laughs> from psychoneurosis. Because to, to be present, to be fully present, means not having some of our attention, some of our psychic resources devoted to keeping out of awareness things we find aversive. It means really being open to the moment, to the joys and sorrows of the moment. So becoming integrated becoming fully present, being here now, having fewer defenses. These are all ways of describing a unitary kind of growth and development, which in, a, in psychological language, we use one set of words. In spiritual traditions, we use other sets of words. But I think we're describing a unitary kind of healing, or as I see it, inching toward sanity. And, um, uh, and that's where the um, one of the other synergies between this project of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which, I mean, the reason governments are authorizing it and things are not, they want us to have spiritual awakening, it's to resolve PTSD, to resolve intractable depression and the like. But the movement toward doing that through the psychedelic movement is also part of the movement toward waking up. Um, th th these are one and the same uh, process, although we can describe them uh, with, with different languages for different purposes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sandy, or Sand. Hi, uh, I thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ron, for the uh, great session. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may ask. Um, the first question is, uh, yeah, I have practiced a bit of mindfulness. I've been to ashrams and things. Um, what I've observed is, as say, for example, I go to an ashram for 10 days, it's all nice, peaceful. You do your practice, it's good. 
But once you come back to the real world, <laughs> where you have your job, kids, family, bills to pay, all that peacefulness vanishes. So again, in your experience, how, like taking these um, psychedelics, um, one of the purposes, as you mentioned, is to for spiritual growth, have that compassion and being peaceful and also happy, right? Has that helped you in your own experience? Because I've never tried it. And that's part one, number one. The second question is more like a theoretical question. Do you see the difference between, um, say, psilocybin, what, what, psilocybin, DMT, which are naturally are occurring organic compounds, versus ketamine, LSD, which are synthetic? Um, okay, well, let me let me start with the first one because uh, sure. both good and large questions. Um, the many a person who has gone on a meditation retreat has faced the disappointment of leaving and and going from states of expansive, relaxed, present-centered, loving, humble relationship to the moment and thinking, hey, this is what waking up feels like. This is so wonderful. And then, you know, inside of like 10 minutes at home having an argument with a spouse and, you know, Pamo, it's gone. What happened, right? Um, exactly, yeah. It, there's a lot of neuroplasticity in life. And um, I used to feel, I used to believe that the purpose of meditation retreats was to arrive at these states of peace, these states of, oh, I'm so Zen, these states of really tasting food and enjoying the tree. And yes, that is part of what happens, but something much more and much more important happens during a meditation retreat. Slowly, slowly, we learn how to relate to the contents of our minds. And slowly what we get is, no, the idea isn't so much to be in this concentrated state or this deeply relaxed state. The idea is to be in a state of friendly relationship to whatever arises in the mind, which then can carry over to friendly relationship to the fact that suddenly I'm enraged with my partner or my partner is enraged with me because they think I've been on vacation, but I've gotten all opened up and now I'm overly sensitized to their criticism as just one example of the millions of things that can be difficult when we when we come out of retreat. And here's where our work with integrating uh, mindfulness practices into psychotherapy becomes so informative and so useful for the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy project because what happens in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, the, the most frequent report of things not being optimal that we see in the research, like from the MAPS trial of MDMA for PTSD, is people say, well, okay, my PTSD got better, but now I am so opened up and I don't know how to live with this degree of sensitivity and without my old defenses. And I feel like I feel disoriented. I feel I'm being buffeted around in the world. Very much like happens when you come home from a meditation retreat and you know you walk into a McDonald's and it's like, oh my God, you know, I, Ronald McDonald scared the bejeebers out of me. You know, you know the, we're sensitized and we have a lot of trouble with it. So much as what we learn from the mindfulness and psychotherapy world and doing mindfulness retreat practice that we learn that, okay, it's not about trying to arrive at a state. It's trying to arrive at a certain relationship to experience that can apply to pleasant and unpleasant experiences as they arise. That's what we gradually learn to do. And um, uh, since you asked personally, when I'm meditating more, I'm absolutely saner than when I'm meditating less. But that sanity includes being sensitized. So I might still be rather reactive. But you know, when, when people are thinking about equanimity as one of the, the goals of both the psychedelic work and the and the meditative work, there's two kinds of equanimity. One is, oh, I'm so calm, I'm so zen, basically a lack of sympathetic arousal. Well, you can develop that kind of equanimity with a benzodiazepine, with a tranquilizer. The equanimity of I can ride the full roller coaster of human experience and have faith that it'll be okay because I'm not reifying. I get it's fluid. I'm not getting stuck in my narratives. I have this metacognitive awareness. I'm not getting stuck in, a ver in an aversion response and I'm not being identified with me as so important and separate from the rest. I'm, I'm going through those 
if you will, you'll recognize the, the sort of four propensities of the brain and their, their antidotes. Well, that is then a much more profound level of freedom um, that we have. And, and I think in my experience, both the psychedelic work and the meditative uh, disciplines can, can inch us um, in that direction. As to the difference between the synthesized and the non-synthesized, um, you know, each medicine has its own signature, but um, I found both LSD and ketamine experiences to be quite, quite powerful and quite, quite useful. Um, I don't personally judge them to be more or less uh, useful or powerful than substances that, that naturally um, uh, arise from plants. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ron. Appreciate that, mate. Sure, totally. Um, Amanda. Dr. Steele, um, I am fascinated by uh, what you're addressing here. I want to know more about the insurance and legal perspective from your from your. I'm sorry, Amanda. Story. I'm having a little trouble. I'm having a little trouble. Could you get a little closer to the microphone? Whatever, however you're speaking, you're muffled. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Um, Hang on just a moment. Can you it's better now. There you go. That that's much better. Man, we had you clearly for a second. Can you hear me better now? Perfectly. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I am fascinated by what you've uh disclosed to us today. Um, I uh want to know more about your experience with the insurance and legal context of how to approach uh, psychedelic therapies, uh, both in Australia and in the United States um, and in other countries. And I would also love to know more about um, how to integrate meditative practices with uh, psychedelic therapies. So one of the things that I'm experiencing recently in my own um, uh, practice, so I, one of the things I believe is that a, a practitioner or, or a, a leader should also have experienced what a psychedelic uh, journey is like. And uh, one of the things that is occurring now is that we have a group experience that uh, people are starting to introduce. So I would love to know more about insurance, legal, group, and, um, and also processing okay. how to integrate okay. meditation and psychedelic therapies. Okay. Um uh, there, there are other people who are much more knowledgeable about the Australian context. And um, if you go to the Mind Medicine Australia we website, I'm sure you'll get a lot of detail about that. They're in the process yeah. of, of rolling this out. In in the U.S., the only really legal um, uh, form of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in psychotherapy is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And it, mm. it involves ketamine off-label. Ketamine is approved as a dissociative anesthetic, but can be used off-label by any prescriber who has a DEA license. It's, it's Schedule Three in the United States, which means um, has potential for um, uh, being habit-forming and problematic, but also has known medical uses. Uh, and there's a lot of CAP or ketamine-assisted psychotherapy going on. None of it is covered by insurance specifically, except the integration sessions, which are psychotherapy sessions, can be billed to insurances in the States as psychotherapy. And we'll see, it may be as soon as August that there's a rollout of MDMA for PTSD, but uh, that's going to be up to the Food and Drug Administration. Um, as to how to use these to integrate, um, there aren't protocols yet, but I would start by um, early on, if a client who is going to experience some kind of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy shows some interest and willingness to learn some mindfulness practice, either begin teaching it to them, to them if you have the um, uh, experience with with doing that in session so that they can begin to and and give them the homework assignment of practicing each day mm -hmm. you know for for a number of weeks before the session or direct them to an app or direct them to a local meditation community i i i think that that's probably likely to be helpful to them don't have research data on this and this is all within the caveat that 
you know, we've done a lot of research in the United States. Willoughby Britton at Brown University is 15 years into a study of the adverse effects of mindfulness practices. This is part of the general principle that anything which is powerful enough to be useful in the world of neuroplasticity is powerful enough to be harmful in the world of neuroplasticity. And, um, you know, so in introducing mindfulness practices to people, it's it's useful to have enough training yourself so you have you can get a sense of the kind of person who might have a lot of trouble um, even just staying with their breath for a bit. And I would suggest that the kind of person who's likely to have a lot of trouble just staying with their breath a little bit is likely to have trouble with psychedelic experiences because there's a there's an overarching diagnostic consideration that doesn't appear in the DSM that we could frame uh, something like this. To what degree is this person generally at home with their inner experience? And there are people, whether they're poets, artists, introspective types, psychotherapists who are generally at home with their inner experience and generally have an attitude of curiosity. And if there's sadness there, they want to feel the sadness. If there's fear there, they want to investigate the fear. And then there are other people who live on their phones, who are really distracting themselves all day, every day from inner experience. And all you need is 20 minutes of attempted mindfulness practice and you find out who's who um, uh, uh, fairly quickly. Um, and I think that that diagnostic information also uh, is potentially quite useful for deciding uh, who needs what kind of entree into the psychedelic assisted therapy if they're a candidate for that. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jason. Hi, Dr. Royal. Thank you so much for your um, speech today. Um, that was really helpful. Uh, um, I, I'll start with introducing myself. Well, um, I represent the generation of the 30s who had experience with psychedelic and stuff like that, which um, brought me here into this kind of industry. Uh, I get really, uh, really interested with the psychedelic part and the therapeutic part that it brought. I'm actually focusing more on the cannabis part at this point, but... Um, um, it's quite a long work still in Australia, and I believe that um, there's still a possibility that it will come into in place that it will be more accessible. And talking about the um, psychedelic assisted therapy that brought my interest, um, because I just want to, you know, like show my my knowledge about it, and uh, because of true experience, where maybe it's due to the psychedelic or the MDMA or LSD and stuff like that. But I believe that they do have work um um in he and uh, it's i think it's people that don't understand the, the part where relaxation is really important it's which it, it comes with my experience in hospitality that i see some traumas coming from their daily lives as you just said in your presentation as well um everything that comes into them um it just put more anxiety depression and um post trauma and um i'm focusing now as well with um with therapies where I listen to a lot of stories. Um, I understand that the generation gap also put a hindrance with that, um, with implementing this kind of therapy in in in, in general um, public. Um, do you believe that um, this kind of therapy will be associated in the future just to, you know, like help others um, in a more relaxed state, it's not just more of like a medicinal or like a, a hospital background, but it's yeah. into it's, kind of like more relaxing this, state as well, yeah. like meditations well, this, and stuff like that. Sure. I mean, this is a very interesting question and predicting how things will unfold politically and culturally mm -hmm. is very hard to do. Um, in Oregon, for example, in the United States, um, they're opening, in essence, um, workshop exploration centers that are not in a medical model. In other words, a person is not getting a psychiatric diagnosis and, and we're not looking for uh, alleviation of DSM style symptoms. People are going in for psychological and spiritual exploration. We'll see how it unfolds. The training for, for, um, uh, for sitters or um, guides is pretty light. There, it's about 140 hours of of training, which you know, as a psychologist, where it took me 
about 10 years in retrospect before I started feeling like I have I have I have some sense of what I'm doing a bit. Um, you know, 140 hours feels light to me. People are complicated. We're complicated. And figuring out how to be useful and not being harmful is 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 no easy task. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that kind of thing unfolds. I, I mean, intuitively, it seems better than putting people in jail, for sure. But um, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and and last question: um, Do you let, believe let that? Me, you know, the, uh... I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm sorry, Jason. I'm just I'm yeah. just aware of the time, and I I want oh, to yes, give us sure. a moment, or maybe we no just, worries. Maybe Thank we you, Thomas. Stop. Thank you. I don't know I, if we can take one one other. Scott, you you you. I'm, I'm also wary that you've been extremely generous, and we have we have already run over the advertised time. So perhaps let's just have one last question, and then um and we'll we'll finish up. Especially as you are up up quite late, Ron. So perhaps Steve. yeah. Uh, well, I'm 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 a, I. I actually enjoy this 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 kind of thing, so uh, I'm okay with it. But you may also you may also need to stop and have other 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 boundaries, um, which I'd like to respect. So let's see. So who's next? Is it? Um, well, we have Steve. We have Steve and Flo Steve. with two last hands up. So if you're happy to take two last questions, then let's do that. That'd be fine. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Ron. Um, I, I always I always ask the easy questions. I'm curious. Um, about your thoughts about integration and how much is enough because I'm looking at, I've been doing the CPAT course and we talk about people having integration and follow up in six months, nine months. But similar to you, I had a lot of fair few psychedelics, late 60s, early 70s, and spent a lot of time integrating that, which you know included traveling around the world for a year, doing primal therapy, mindful meditation, even became a counseling psychologist all because, as you mentioned, if you have significant psychedelic stuff, it opens you up to stuff and you can't put the lid back on. You've then got to work out what's going on in order to integrate so that you can have a happy life. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on everyone doing psychedelic therapy and then having integration for nine months, 18 months. What, what yeah. do you think about all of that? Well, well, I, th I think it depends on what we see as our goals. Um, you know, if our goal is a certain degree of symptom alleviation um, and then getting kind of stable after that without too many symptoms, then if a person, th then it depends on who we're talking about. If we're, if we're talking about somebody who has a terrible attachment history, for, which for those of you who aren't mental health professionals, basically means they didn't get a lot of love and support as a kid in a way that could help them regulate their emotions as a young child. And we, go, we then go into the world, experiencing the world as basically an unsafe place and experiencing our inner world as an unsafe place. There's a lot of people with that kind of history in the world very often that is what makes people more susceptible to trauma. So many people who were treating with trauma have those kinds of histories. And, you know, that takes years of uh, an intimate therapeutic relationship, usually to develop, a, you know, a kind of trust and shift from feeling quite lost in the world to feeling like I can trust other people and I can trust my feelings. So there's the psychedelic experience, which is aiding this therapeutic process, but it's not going to take care of the whole therapeutic process. There, this is going to have to occur in a relational context. And I think that takes a long time. Now, are there methods other than expensive individual psychotherapy that might work? Absolutely. My my friend Roz Watts over in the UK, she's trying to develop integration communities that can hold people and help them develop relational skills and help them develop a sense of safety and love within within community pods. There, I, I think we have to be very creative about this because that kind of work takes a long time. Ultimately, the integration of a psychedelic experience. I'm still working on the one when I was 17. I was, you know, and I just turned 70. Um, that was an insight into non-duality, which I tap into here and there at different points in my life. But I get all caught up in ego nonsense and, you know, you know, and 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 obsessional worries and all sorts of things still. Am I living in this non-dual state? Nope, not there yet. That's why I like to refer to it as inching towards sanity, because it's a it's a process. So I, I think these are lifelong journeys for most of us. Um, the question is, 
how much and what form of help do we need to do it? At what stages do we need perhaps an individual psychotherapist? When could we benefit from a group? When could we benefit from being part of a community? When could we benefit from simply having a meditation practice, being in a, a sangha or a community of other, other people who are doing this, this kind of work? And, and we're doing it quite outside of the, uh, the medical model. But to be fully integrated, to fully experience a cup of tea, I'm still working on it. There are moments, but it's it, this is this is not my 24/7 experience. And in a sense, the full integration of what happened when I was 17 would be to regularly fully experience a cup of tea. So do, do we need to uh, alert people who are having psych psychedelics in the preparation that, in some sense, this experience is going to open up, melt the boundaries between you and the world and other people and relationships, and you're going to be a lot more sensitized. And you'll probably have to do a whole lot of work to learn how to manage that. It's a bit like getting I, on a I, racing I motorbike. So. I think so. I mean, I think we have to be um, humble about it and say, I can't really be sure how this is going to unfold for you because we can't. But often people experience what you just said, Steve, and, uh, and um, I don't want you to think should you experience that, that something has gone wrong. This is part of the process. A huge variable in doing any kind of psychological work is whether we're judging whatever's happening as somehow wrong and it shouldn't be happening, or whether we're trusting that this is part of some kind of process. We may be in a liminal state, meaning a state between stages of development that feels quite unmoored, but trusting that there is a process. This is We hear the theme of trusting and inner healing intelligence spoken very often in uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. That, that notion so that whatever happens becomes a potential teaching also a principle we see in mindfulness-oriented psychotherapies, whatever arises, what can I learn from this? I, yes, I think um, orienting people toward that attitude uh, can be useful. And, and alerting them to all the long-term resources that they will probably yeah, right. need to stay on top of it. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you. Finish out, absolutely, good question, thank you. To finish out the evening flow or the afternoon for you in Australia. It's evening, I'm in Seattle. Um, I, I just wanted to say I'm still a student and I read your book and it's such an honor to speak to you. Um, I am very interested in becoming um, a psychedelic assisted therapist and work with domestic violence survivors. And I was, under, I, I was interested in understanding how mindfulness and compassion and psychedelic assisted therapy uh, can be specifically tailored um, to support um, domestic violence survivors. And I was wondering if you uh, could elaborate on the potential mechanism by which uh, psychedelic therapy, uh, assisted therapy, uh, could facilitate the healing process of um, this population. Well, big question. Let me see if I can touch on just a few points. One of the things that we've learned over the last, oh, I don't know, 25 years of seriously and systematically trying to integrate mindfulness practices into psychotherapy is that it's not a one size fits all endeavor. Mm -hmm. That um, while for one person sitting down and following the breath and when the mind goes into thoughts, coming back to the breath might be an ideal practice for another person, that practice is going to be a very bad fit. For people who are in unsafe situations, or people who have recently experienced very unsafe situations. Typically, the kinds of mindfulness practices they need are the kinds of things that we think of as grounding practices in trauma treatment. Let's practice walking and paying attention to the feet touching the ground. Let's walk in a safe public park and pay attention to the appearance of the trees. Let's go from tree to tree to tree. We're stepping out of the thought stream. We're coming to sensory reality, but we're not doing it in here. We're not doing it where the emotions live. We're not closing our eyes and getting involved in our imaginal worlds. We're learning how to feel safe in, in and grounded in the external world. And I would suggest that having some of that experience 
is probably going to be important before doing anything like psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is so unmooring. It can unmoor us from our bodies. It can unmoor us from tangible conventional reality. And while it can be very helpful for deep healing, it's got to be coming from a place of safety, being in a safe environment and returning to a safe place of safety. And in my experience, people who have recently experienced domestic violence, there's very little safety um, in their world. And, and we really have to start with baby steps of how to, how to navigate the world and, and, and feel a little bit safer to begin with. I, I think we have to be really careful about one size fits all um, approaches to anything that we do, because there's there's so much diversity among us, and we haven't even touched on cultural diversity and uh, ethnic racial diversity. I mean, there you know there there's so many different kinds of diversity that we need to um, uh, to pay attention to when when trying to help people on uh, psychological or spiritual paths. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, terrific. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, we really do appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge and wisdom um, and particularly appreciate your generosity with your time um, in staying on to answer everyone's questions. Um, just as a couple of final notes, I did notice a few comments in the chat there from people who are interested in joining the training. I would encourage anyone who's considering joining to put your applications in soon as it's filling up for our July cohort. And then perhaps as one last little plug, um, at MMA, we have started doing some meditation sessions online on Friday at lunchtimes. And it's largely for the reasons of everything that Ron has done such a great job of um, sharing with us today. And so if anyone does want to join us on our events page, you can jump on and it's a little group online session that takes place every week on Fridays at 12.30. So that's as something as an opportunity. Maybe some people here tonight might feel inspired to come and join us there. But um, with that, Ron, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, we really do it. I appreciate you. You're welcome, everybody. And I just put in the chat again, handouts at yahoo.com, subject line Australia. It's a ploy to get you on my mailing list if you're interested in these, these topics so I can tell you about other events that are coming up and things because I like to teach. So in order to teach, I need people who wanna who who wanna participate. So that that that's what that's all about. Okay. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, for um for inviting me and and uh, and for all the work you're doing at uh at MMA, it's um, uh, you're really at the vanguard worldwide of this. Terrific, thank you so much, Ron. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you all next month.